Well, friends, we uh, come to that time in our service when we turn to the Lord's Word and uh, look for instruction from Him to strengthen our faith and encourage our walk. So I'm going to ask that you take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to read that section that we've been studying from uh, verse uh, 10 down to verse 20. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 6, just follow with me as I read, beginning at verse 10. Okay, remembering that this is the word of the Lord. Finally, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador, an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. Let's just bow in prayer for a moment. Father, <clears throat> it's in weakness and body that I stand here to declare your word this morning. And I look to you and to your spirit for strength. I look for the unction, the power of your word that you would speak through me, that you would use me. I'm merely a vessel today. Let your spirit transform the truth into our hearts and our minds that we may know and understand, that our faith may be encouraged, that our lives will be um, greatly enhanced, that our walk would become more and more worthy of the calling that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we ask that you will be praised this morning through our response, through our listening, through the transformation of your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <clears throat> I read over my notes this morning and they're a jumbled mess. <laughs> but I think that there is a good lesson here for us that we need to grasp. So I'm asking that you look beyond me and listen to what God has to say and to his word this morning. What we have discovered so far in our study of this section, which in most of our Bibles is entitled The Whole Armor of God, and we haven't actually got to that section yet. It doesn't begin until verse 14. But we've been spending a lot of time in this, these verses, of verse 11 down to 13, and particularly verse 12, where it tells us that, Paul tells us that uh, our Christian life is a hard life to live. Living life in this world is hard to live. Uh, particularly for the first century people and first century Christians, it was very difficult. Uh, life was hard. And add to it that you had a faith in, in Jesus Christ seemed to be a new religion. It added a greater amount of persecution and suffering trials and tribulations and you and I don't experience a lot of that here in North America but it's coming it's coming 
I don't know when it's coming, but the way our governments are moving, the way our courts are moving, they are on a fast track against the church. They are on a fast track against the scriptures and God's truth. And anyone who would proclaim to live their lives by the Bible. It used to be that Christians were the most respected people in society. Today, we are nothing but intolerant phobiatics. Is that such a word? <laughs> you understand what it is. So it said, it is now. And I don't know where the future is for us and as individual believers. But it's not something that is new. It's something that has always been there. When Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he was writing to a church in a city which was very large, very um, very robust, and, uh, <clears throat> and a city that, that, um, that persecuted the Christians quite a bit. And they knew what it meant to have trials and tribulations. And he explained to them in the first part of the books how they are in Christ, how they are positionally in Christ and all the benefits that they have. And how in that, those, that being in Christ um, requires also a walk of obedience and a walk of righteousness. We took on Christ's righteousness when we were justified and now we learn to live and walk in His holiness and in righteousness. And it's difficult. It's difficult to live the Christian life. But verse 10 tells us, finally, getting to the end of the book, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord. The command there actually is um, strengthen yourself in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in your Lord. It is because of your position in Christ that you have every available strength that you need to be victorious in this world. And it's not talking about having a life free of persecution. It's not talking about living a life that is free of trials and tribulations. It's talking about living a life of victory in all of those situations. So that at the end of the day, the Christian is always still standing. And that's what we do. We stand because we are standing in the strength of the Lord. And it is the Lord's strength that we stand in. Uh, when we go back to chapter 1, and we're going to look a little closer at this, in chapter 1, verse 19, it tells us that His immeasurable greatness of His power is in us all who believe, and that He is far above all rule, verse 21, in power and dominion, that Christ is reigning on the throne, and He is the Lord of the universe. And the Lord is the one who has both the will and the power to do whatever He wants and to accomplish the will of God and the plan of God. And verse 11, Paul tells us then to put on the whole armor of God. The, the sense there is, is literally that we are to wear it. The idea is that we are actually already wearing the armor of God. It's not so much a command to put it on as to continue to wear the, the armor of God that He has given to us. And he tells us to wear the armor of God and we will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So what we have been doing for the last several weeks is we've been looking at other scriptures to try to understand what the Bible teaches us about our enemy. It's always said that, a, that uh, an army should be aware of their enemy and uh, so we were doing that. We did that in a little mini series of messages um, called Defeated Foe. We saw that that our enemy is defeated. And <clears throat> verse 12 then identifies where the schemes of the devil come about, where his, his uh, workings, what it, how it is that he comes against us in living this Christian life. And the thing that we need to understand here is that we are not fighting the devil directly. It is not a battle against demons. It is not a battle against the devil, but it is against that, that those spiritual forces that are in the heavenly realm, that are in the, the um, spiritual realm that is unseen, and they are working through the rulers and the authorities. They're working through uh, 
the, the cosmic powers. Now, I, that's a really a bad translation, and if you remember when we looked at it, literally it's talking about the um, worldly rule, wherever the world rules. And he's talking about the rule of the heart. And the, the dark age is the age of, of darkness. Sinful man is in darkness. We are in the kingdom of darkness. And he's talking about, um, about the, the, the flesh and the world and the lust of the and desires of the flesh and of the eye and so forth and all those things. And the devil works through these things to bring us down, to discourage us, to, to uh, make us um, to make us not victorious. How would you say that properly? Defeated. To defeat us in our Christian lives. And to destroy our faith. But we will stand because we are able to fight against the schemes of the devil. So today what we're going to do is we, we, we've been looking, we looked at our enemy. We looked at Revelation 12. Uh, the whole picture of the dragon and how he was defeated at the uh, cross through the blood of the Lamb, and how we defeated him in the blood, and, <clears throat> and that his whole objective in being thrown to the earth is to attack the woman, to attack the church, and uh, he's doing that until the end of the age. Then we looked at Revelation 13. We looked at the beasts and how they are a personification of, uh, of the attacks of the devil against the church and against <coughs> you and me <clears throat> through governments and through... through um, <coughs> courts and through laws, etc., etc., and also through religious organizations and false teaching and false prophets. Then we look at 1 John 2 and, and chapter 4 when he talked about Antichrist. Antichrist, again, is not an individual, but it is any, anyone who speaks against, um, in particular, against the deity or the humanity of Christ. He's a false teacher, both within the church and without the church. Then we looked at 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of lawlessness. Today, we need to see that not only is he, is our enemy a defeated foe, but that he is sovereignly controlled. And this is very important. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit here this morning and challenge your brain, um, to challenge your brain cells and see if you can uh, get around this. I want you to think of this morning. Let's just pretend that this morning when you were getting ready for church, you men, you were at the sink and you were, had the shaving cream on and you were shaving and the women, you were um, doing your hair, you had the radio on and all of a sudden the newscaster uh, came over the airwaves and, and uh, he announced that the night before, at exactly midnight, every place of prostitution, every pornographic store, every gambling casino, every place of demonic worship, and every other place of evil and sinful act activity all mysteriously collapsed and were completely destroyed. What would your reaction be to that? <laughs> That's right. Who would you say caused that to happen? See? You, you, you might rush to church and say something like, hey, did you hear what God did last night? You would definitely think that God was behind some kind of a mystery like that, wouldn't you? The newscaster might have stated his explanation, but you would definitely attribute it to God and you would rejoice at his sovereign work. Now, friends, just suppose the following Sunday morning you're still doing the same thing, getting ready for church. And you have your radio on and you hear another bizarre and mysterious report. Only this time you hear that every single Bible-believing church in the country had collapsed and was totally destroyed. That would mean our church as well. Now what would you say about the cause? Would you still say that God did this? Or would you say that the devil did it? Most Christians would say that God did the first and the devil did the second. But why would anyone blame or, or credit God for the first situation and then credit the devil for the second situation? When people give all the good to God and all the bad to the devil, you're guilty of an ancient heresy known as dualism. dualism. 
Dualism basically places God and the devil, or good and bad, as two independent and sovereign powers struggling for all the control of this world. We hope our side wins, but at times it doesn't look that promising. When we do that, we are actually denying the sovereignty of God. By very definition, in order for God to be sovereign, there cannot be another sovereign. He is the supreme sovereign. He is not subject to any uh, of his subjects. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, to whomever he wants. God alone is the supreme sovereign. And he is omniscient as the sovereign God. He has the power to do everything that he plans to happen. And he can overflow, overthrow any of his enemies. <clears throat> you might think that it makes it easier to believe and to love him by exempting him from anything that appears evil or bad and crediting, it, and crediting God with everything that is righteous and good. But it actually harms God's reputation. Let's just suppose for a moment again, let me th get you thinking in another way. Let's just suppose that you were in a very bad car accident this week. And you came, and I came into the, your hospital room, and I said to you, remember, God had nothing to do with this. How would that make you feel? It, it wouldn't be long before you would be asking some serious, logical questions like, well, where was God when it happened? Couldn't he have prevented it? Why didn't he prevent it? Was the devil stronger than God and caused the accident, even though God was trying desperately to prevent it from happening? You might conclude that God isn't as powerful as you thought that he was. Or you might be tempted to believe that God just chose not to act. And that would make him unloving, uncaring, and indifferent to what happens to you. Back in 1983, 1983, when I was pastoring a church in Fredericton, New Brunswick, a lot of negative things happened to my ministry such that we were forced to leave. In fact, we were asked to leave the church and to return to Ontario. And I did not understand why this was happening. I began to think in my mind that in order for these bad things to happen, it must mean that God does not really act in all circumstances. In fact, I had determined that in order for God to be sovereign, it means that God didn't have to act. In all, it did not necessitate him to act in every situation. He could if he wanted to, but he just didn't want to. And that conclusion led me into a 13-year depression. And, but God never left me alone. I kept reading, kept studying, and kept trying to justify all of these bad things that happened to me. And it wasn't until one day I realized that the bad also came from God as much as the good that I realized that everything that happened to me, good or bad, was sovereignly controlled by God. That it was not an enemy who was stronger or more powerful than God, but it was God using the enemy to accomplish a purpose and plan in my life. And I believe with all of my heart that everything that I went through and the 13 years of struggle and intense studying the Word of God has brought me to the place where today I can declare to you the truth of God's Word, that He is the supreme, sovereign God who controls everything, the good and the bad, and that we can be comforted by the fact that He plans it all, and that the enemy is nothing but a tool in the hands of God. And, and 
What I came to understand was that God controls all things, the good and the bad, and that everything, every circumstance happens for my good and for his glory. Notice I didn't say that every circumstance is good, but that God is in control of every circumstance for my good and for his glory. I mean, that's what Ephesians 5.20 says, if you remember when we looked at that, where it says, we give thanks always and for everything to God the Father. And, and look at Ephesians 6.10 again. It says that we are commanded, <coughs> <coughs> we are commanded to be strong because we are strong. And why are we strong? Because the Lord is strong and his dominion is strong. And he is the sovereign God who is in control of the enemy. Our God is big enough and strong enough to control the bad things as well as the good things. If he isn't, then we are in big trouble. And that's what 612 is doing. It's putting our enemy in its proper place. Yes, our enemy is in many ways stronger than us. But they are under the authority of the Lord's kingdom. They are a defeated foe who is trying to wreak havoc in God's kingdom. But they can't do anything without the king allowing it to happen. So what we're going to do for the rest of this message today is I'm going to take you through some of the verses that we have already looked at in terms of our enemy and show to you how God is sovereignly controlling the enemy. So the first thing I want to do, let's turn to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to go through these things fairly quickly. And I am trusting that you remember the context of the previous messages <clears throat> for most of the detail. Revelation chapter 12, we're looking at the fact that our enemy is a defeated foe, but sovereignly controlled. The th two things that we see here is that the dragon, who is the devil, Satan himself, um, is as a problem with the child who is Jesus Christ and a problem with the woman who represents the church and all who are born to her, all who are born spiritually to her in, throughout the church age. Look at verse 4. Speaking of the devil, it says, And he swept his tail down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might what? devour it. You see, the dragon's goal was to devour the child when he was born. Satan's goal was to defeat Jesus when he came into this world. Look at verse 5. She gave birth to the male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness. <coughs> And in that little phrase there, in verse 5, we have the entire life of Jesus from his birth through to his ascension. <clears throat> and we know that Satan's plan and objective from the moment that Jesus was born until the moment that he died was to destroy the Christ, to do everything he can to bring him to total destruction. And so what I want us to do is I want you to see that. So turn over to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. There's no doubt that God had a master plan for the redemption of the world. Isn't that right? Would you agree with me that he had planned before the foundation of the world all who would be saved and that Jesus would be born to die and bring about redemption for all who, who would be born spiritually. Okay, this was God's plan. He's going to redeem the world. And it was planned before he ever created things. There's no doubt about that. And here we have the dragon waiting for Christ to be born so that he could devour it. And the devil is against Jesus from the beginning. Uh, even in Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 when it's talking about the temptation of Jesus it tells us that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You see it was not the devil coming to Jesus to tempt him. The devil did tempt him 
But it was only as the Spirit led Christ into the wilderness. You see, he is sovereignly controlled. He cannot tempt Christ unless God were to allow it to happen. God was testing the Son, and he used the devil to do the testing. And God had planned that Jesus would die before the foundation of the world. And Jesus acknowledges the plan. Look at verse 2 of chapter 26, Matthew 22. Jesus said, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be what? To be crucified. Jesus is announcing to his disciples, in two days, I will be crucified. Now for several weeks earlier, he had been saying to them, I'm going to Jerusalem where I will be delivered over to the Romans and I will be crucified and put to death. Now, in two days, Jesus is announcing God's plan for the redemption of the world. And when we come down to verse 18, Jesus says to, to them, he says, go into the city uh, and you'll find the man. The teacher says, my time is at hand. The plan is about to happen and come to fruition. And the verse 24 it says, The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. You see, the whole plan of redemption was not only planned in eternity past, but it was announced all through the Old Testament, through the prophets and through the example of the Israelites, so that we are without excuse in knowing what was going to happen to him. And he is telling us that God had a plan and that the plan was going to happen exactly as God had determined that it was going to happen. And we know that the devil was out to destroy Jesus and have him killed. Look at verse 3 of chapter 26. The chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and what? And kill him. Whose plan is it to kill Jesus? It is Caiaphas, the high priest, and the other priests, and the elders. It is their plan to kill Jesus. But whose plan is it from the beginning? God's plan. God's plan. And when we come down to verse... Uh, <clears throat> the suffering of Jesus from this point until his resurrection was planned and ordained and decreed by God. This is the underlining plan behind the events of these two days that Jesus was talking about. But there is this devilish element. There is this man plan that is in there. The devilish plan that is coming together. But unlike God's plan where every detail was determined before creation, the plans of the devil and of men are never cast in stone. Men plan on the spur of the moment. And the details of their plan change as circumstances and people change. And the thing that we need to remember is that the plans of man and the plans of the devil are controlled by the plan of God. So much so that we can say that the plans of man always bring about the plan of God. There's a statement that the Puritans used to say, what God sovereignly decrees in eternity, man will always demand in time. So with the devil's plan included the conspiracy of the chief priests and the elders, the betrayal of Judas, and the frustrated plan of Pilate. Verse 3, we've already looked at it. They gathered together. Um, they were summoned together by the high priest, and they have a plan to kill him. But I want you to notice this. Look at verse 5. And they said but not during the feast. Wait a minute. The plan of the high priest is that Jesus would not be killed during the feast. They want to find a time after the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. Then they will kill him. That was their decision. That's what they decided. Is that God's plan? No. Look at verse 14. One of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And <clears throat> verse 14 tells us that Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest. 
Now, I, I think we can safely say that it was during this two-day period that he did this. In fact, verse 2 says the two days of the Passover is coming. Verse 17, Jesus talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Their, their Passover and Unleavened Bread were referred to the same period of time, so there's only two days. But verse 14, the verb in verse 14 can be translated, having gone to the chief priest. Okay? So Judas, having gone to the chief priest, he said to them, in other words, he said to them, uh, he, he said to them they, the chief of the priests and the elders said, not during the feast, but Jesus spoke up and said to them, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? In other words, if you go after him, it may cause a riot, which is the reason that they weren't going to do it. But if I did it, it wouldn't be a problem because I am one of his disciples. And I can do it when there's no people around. I know where he likes to go off by himself and pray. What made Judas act as he did is a mystery. But that he had decisively turned against Jesus was now determined, uh, was now determined to help in his elimination seems to be without any doubt. But well, what we need to notice is that the greed or the hatred of Judas toward Jesus changed the timing of the chief priest's plan. They said, not during the feast. Judas, in essence, said, what if I can deliver to him sooner without causing a riot? Man's plans always change because of changing circumstances or other people. But they always end up doing what God ultimately has planned. God planned it that Jesus would be crucified, that he would be crucified at the time of the Passover. A Judas not convinced the chief priest otherwise, he would not have died. It would have been after Passover. It would have been after the Passover. His motivation was greed. That Judas would turn against Jesus was part of God's plan. That Judas would be a lover of money was part of God's plan. That Judas would betray Jesus before the feast was part of God's plan. The chief priest would accept his terms was part of God's plan to make God's plan come to fruition. They're sovereignly controlled. Every part of the plan was planned before time began. And every part of the plan happens in time as God had planned. What God sovereignly planned in eternity, man will always demand in time. There's another aspect here, and I don't have a lot of time to go into a lot of the detail. But in order for Jesus to be on the cross at the moment that the, um, the, 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 the sacrifice was being made in the temple, meant that Jesus would have to actually celebrate Passover a day earlier than all the rest of the Jews. And if you look at this really closely, that is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus had already prearranged that they would, they would celebrate Passover the day before the actual day of Passover celebration, before the 10th of Nisan. Jesus caused God's plan to happen. And then, of course, he referred to Ju Judas, etc., etc. Well, look at... Um, where am I here? So I, I, I want to skip some stuff, but I got to... Make sure I don't get all confused either. Okay? Are you with me so far? All right, good. <clears throat> in verse 30, in verse 30, it tells us that after they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Verse 36 says that they went to a specific place called Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane was probably, when you put all of the Gospels together, it was probably a private garden that, that was probably walled in. Um, by owned by an individual okay? and so it was a place where they allowed Jesus and his disciples to go where they would not be interfered by any outside people and it was private and it was perfect and Judas knew this and uh, Judas came there tells us there in verse uh, uh, again showing how the God's plan verse 45 then came Jesus to the disciples said to them sleep and take your rest later on see the hour is at hand Okay, the, the plan is about to come to fruition. The Son of Man is betrayed. And verse 47, while he was speaking, behold, Judas came, one of the twelve, with the great crowd. And by the way, it wasn't a huge crowd. It was uh, bigger, probably bigger than the 
the disciples, we have to keep in mind that this is a stealth operation. They were doing this on the quiet. They didn't want to cause a riot. So they came with a small group and they arrested Jesus. That tells us there that he could have called a, a thousand angels. Why didn't Jesus do it? Because for him to call for the angels to deliver him would be against God's plan. God had a plan. Okay? And so he was arrested and taken. Look at verse 56. All of this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. All of this. The whole event from Judas, from, from the, 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 uh, the chief priests planning that it was going to be after the... After the, the celebration, Judas saying, look at, hey, if I do it earlier, and then bring them back on track. And then Jesus planning to have the celebration the day earlier so that when he went to the garden, he could be arrested and all night taken to, to, um, uh, to the, having his trials so that when they placed him on the cross and he died at 3 p.m., it was at the very moment that the animals were being sacrificed by the high priest in the temple courts. See, it was all planned by God, yet it came about because of the plan of the enemies. God used them. They were sovereignly controlled. We can show the same thing if we went to the trial. The trial with, with Caiaphas. Again, they were looking for, they weren't looking for false testimony against him. They were looking for specific false testimony that could be used in a Roman court that could condemn him to death. Because here's the problem. The Jews had no laws or rights to be able to condemn someone to death. They wanted Jesus killed. They had to take him to Pilate, but they had to have a charge that Pilate could try him on in order for him to die. Look at, at verse um, um, 59. The chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Okay, a testimony that could be used in a tr Roman trial. In verse 60, but they found none. They had a dilemma. They couldn't get Jesus to trial. So again, they changed their plans. Finally, they found two men who talked about him, Jesus saying that he would destroy the temple. And, uh, but that still wasn't enough to get him put to death. It was certainly enough as, as a cause of resurrection that might get him, <coughs> get him um, flogged by the Romans. But they still needed something to put him to death. And it wasn't coming together. But guess who found the answer? Jesus did. L look at verse uh, 62. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make about this charge of you um, saying that you're going to destroy the temple? Jesus, verse 63, Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. The high priest in frustration actually changed the uh, his, the, the, the subject we went from the temple to him being the Messiah. And Jesus answered and did not say that he was the Messiah, although he said, you have said so. Yes, that's right. I am the Christ. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated in power. In other words, he was referring back to a quote from the Daniel, and he was saying to them that, hey, you may be judging me now, but you're going to see me as your judge. And to that, they rent their clothes, and it tells us, uh, verse 60, uh, the end of verse 66, um, the, they answered, what is your judgment? They answered, he deserves what? Death. So now, not only did they have the motivation and the reason to get him to Pilate, but they had the motivation to get the people to call for his death. But who did it? Jesus did it. They couldn't get him to Pilate unless Jesus had said what he had said. And then when you come to Pilate, it's, it's, it's even uh, all, all the more an amazing story because what do we learn about Pilate? I find no, no fault in this man. I'm going to let him go. And then they said, well, wait a minute. We have a custom that, that you let somebody go. And Pilate says, well, obviously they're going to want to let Jesus, the, the Messiah, go. <coughs> and not this notorious Barabbas. <coughs> it's interesting, you know, that... that uh, some manuscripts give us the name of Barabbas. He is Jesus Barabbas. So he says, you either, do you want Jesus Messiah or do you want Jesus Barabbas? Okay. The thing is, Pilate wanted to let him go. Even Pilate's wife had a dream. Don't let this guy go. There's, he hasn't done anything wrong. 
So Pilate said, well, I need to let him go. And the people were actually starting to side with Pilate until the high priest that said, we need to stir the people up. So they used the words of Jesus against him to the crowd. And he said, he calls himself the Son of God. He says he's our, or the Son of Man, that he is our judge. So the people turned against him and they called for his death. The importance of the temple to the Jews was part of God's plan. The false understanding of Messiah deliverer was part of God's plan. The false charge against Jesus was part of God's plan. Getting Jesus to Pilate was part of God's plan. Every part of the plan was planned before time began. Every part of the plan happened in time as God had planned. And God's, what God sovereignly planned in eternity, man de demanded in time. And even when we come to Pilate, and finally had no fault was God's plan. The custom of letting the prisoners go was God's plan. Pilate's wife's dream was part of God's plan. His wife, um, the, the persuasion of the chief priests was part of God's plan. The people's call for Barabbas, freedom was part of God's plan. Pilate's foiled plan to release Jesus was part of God's plan. Pilate washing his hands was God's plan. The call of the people to crucify him was part of God's plan. Pilate delivering Jesus over to be crucified was part of God's plan. Every part was planned before eternity. Every part of the plan happened in as God had planned and what God had sovereignly planned in eternity, man brought about in time. You see, the enemy thinks he's fighting against God, but he's actually fulfilling the plan of God because God, the, the enemy is a defeated foe who is sovereignly controlled. Where's this one spot? I know I had a spot here that's really good. Oh, here it is. <laughs> I like this part, so I didn't want to miss it. It, it. it seemed as though God's plan was going awry. But what God sovereignly planned in eternity, man always demands in time. I say that over and over again. Let, let me explain it. Okay, you answer these questions. Exactly what did God eternally decree would happen to his son? That he would be crucified, right? Okay, God eternally decreed that Jesus would be crucified. Exactly what did the mad crowd fervently demand? That he be crucified. What is the only thing with regard to the payment of sin that would satisfy the justice and the holiness of God? The shed blood of Jesus, right? What is the only thing that would satisfy the hate and the passion of the crowd? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why verse 25 is so important. It says, and all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. See? The man is filled with wrath. He's filled with a sinful nature. He hates God. God uses sinful men to accomplish his plans. It was God's plan for Jesus to be crucified, yet it was Judas who changed the minds of the elder, the timing of the elder's plan. It was Jesus who had celebrated the Passover a day earlier. It was Jesus who gave the Sanhedrin the ammunition that they needed to convict him. It was the people who overruled Pilate's decision to let Jesus, to, to let Jesus go free. It was the evil in their hearts that accomplished God's plan. Who's in control? God was in control. He placed the right people in the right place at the right time so that their nature would direct their will to do exactly what God had planned. All because these sinful people did what they did because of the sinfulness of their heart, God would also hold them responsible for their sin. I want you to look at one last verse. <laughs> Turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Because Peter refers to this. It's a perfect summary of the sovereignty of God over our enemies. Peter reminds the Jews, Acts 2, verse 22, 
Jesus, Peter reminds the Jews that Christ had all the credentials to prove that he was indeed the promised Messiah. Look at verse 20, uh, that's verse 22. Um, then look at verse 23, we read, This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of who? God. See? It was God's plan to crucify Jesus. It was God's plan. Can you, can you imagine the relief of some of those Jews who, are, who 50 days earlier had cried out, crucify him. And now Peter stands up there and he says, the whole thing was planned by God. Wow! We thought we were guilty and responsible for the death of Jesus. What a relief! God is responsible, not us. Now look at the rest of the verse. What does it say? Verse 23. You crucified and killed and killed him. Peter says, true, it was God's sovereign plan to have Jesus crucified, but that in no way excuses you. You acted out of the hatred of your hearts, and his blood is on your hands. And what we find, friends, even in our own lives, when our enemy attacks, when he attacks us through our neighbors, when he attacks us through our government, when, when he attacks Christians through, um, through religious fanatics, fanatics, whatever he does and he comes against us. We think it's evil coming against us, but it's God allowing it for our good. We just don't always understand and know the plan of God. We're not privy to that. Read Deuteronomy 29, 29, and you'll understand that. Well, fuck. I got to really move here. The next thing we, we read in, 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 uh, in, in Revelation chapter 12, if we go back there, that was just the, the dragon with the, um, with the child, okay? Satan and the child to show how they were sovereignly controlled. The Satan and the, and the woman, the Satan and the church is also sovereignly controlled. I mean, look at, look at verse 12 here, or verse 13. Revelation 12, verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly to the serpent in the wilderness, etc., etc. Verse 15, the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away, but the earth came to the help of the woman. What is, what is happening here in, in, in symbolic language, it is telling us that what the, the, the serpent was doing is he had created this flood to, and uh, he was causing this flood waters to come across into the desert in order to wipe the woman out, to wipe the church out, to destroy the church and all of her offspring. And it tells us that God opened up the earth and swallowed up the water. See, and what we learn from that is that we have a divine protector. Our enemy cannot do anything to us that God does not protect us from and that God does not allow if the enemy attacks in one way and God does not want it to happen, it will not happen. It's as simple as that. They, our enemy is sovereignly controlled. Sovereignly controlled. And when we come to chapter 13 to the beast, there again, um, and I'm going to do this really quick so it might just go over your head, but look at, at um, we have the word aloud. And it's very important to notice this. In verse 5, in verse 7, and again in verse 14, we have this word aloud. And we know that, that it tells us that the two beasts were empowered by the dragon. That that's where they got their power. Okay? And they did the bidding of the dragon against mankind, and particularly against believers. But look at verse 7. Also, it was allowed, the beast was allowed to make war on the saints. Who allowed them to make the war on the saints? God did. They could not make war on us if God did not allow it. God allowed it to happen and to conquer them. And authority was given them. And even verse 14 and 15, talking about the, the land beast, the false images, that he was allowed to work, that he was allowed to give breath to the image. He was allowed, sovereignly controlled, sovereignly controlled. And we need to understand this. This is not demons half-hazardly coming at us at their will. It is only under the allowed will of God. That's the only way that they can come to us. <clears throat> now flip back to Ephesians chapter 6 again. <coughs> uh, let's 
Merci. Verse 10, chapter 6, verse 10, says, Be strong in the Lord. We, and I've talked about this on many occasions. I've already talked, referred to this earlier. In the Lord. The Lord. The word Lord refers to his ruling, that he is the sovereign ruler of the universe. That is where our strength comes, because he is stronger. He is sovereignly controlling our enemies. And if he became the Lord, he defeated our enemies at the cross. And again, go back to chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 19. He has power towards us, the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. A better way of saying that is in us all who believe. He has given us this power and that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places to rule all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over everything that is the church. In Romans 16, 20, Paul says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And that is what is happening. He is being crushed under our feet. <clears throat> and in chapter 3, verse 20, uh, he says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us. The power that is at work in us. There has never been a day when God was more triumphant in his power, love, and holiness than he was on Calvary's cross. Jesus was not a martyr. Jesus was not a victim. This was the day of God's victory. Christ is higher than and far superior to all powers that exist, including every demonic and spiritual power. Christ is the exalted and, and enthroned Lord rules over all. The entire spirit world is subject to him, not only in this age, but in that age which is to come. And Christ reigns now while allowing the evil demigods to exist until Every captive is set free. And every prodigal sheep that the Father has given the Son is brought safely home until all who hear his voice come and follow him. And Christ will reign alone and forever in the age to come after he crushes every enemy under his foot. And this is the picture that we have. He is a defeated foe, that there was a decisive battle at the cross. And there is a final victory at the end of the age. Now, the, the scriptures describe this, the, the activity of Satan in different ways. And one of the things that we, we look at, and I'm going to go do this so fast that some of you are going to wonder what I'm talking about. Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelical, which is the, the first announcement of the gospel, says... In, in God speaking to the, to the serpent said, said your seed uh, the, the seed of the woman will crush your head will bruise your head you will bruise his heel and I was referring to the cross okay, and what we see is that at the enemy that Satan and his, his demons his angels are all crushed now it's not that they we get this image of stepping on his head and crushing it and then he's dead but what he's talking about is symbolically talking about his rule, his headship, his rule within this world, his uh, authority that he may have usurped for himself, that it is, it is gone, that Satan no longer has any control in this world on his own. He never really did, as we come to uh, later. Um, we can... I was going to use an illustration here of... Uh, um, of D-Day and V-Day. Okay? Uh, D-Day happened two years before V-Day, which was the end of the, the Second World War, right? And uh, what happened is, is that, that on the end of D-Day, when, when um, the Allies had come in, they, they had landed on the beaches of Normandy, and, and in three days they dumped one point million men and tons and tons of war material into Europe, and they were making their way towards towards Berlin 
Everybody knew then and there that Hitler was lo had lost the war. It was just now a matter of time. Now, some of the fiercest battles still happened, um, like the Battle of the Ball between D-Day and V-Day. And a lot of people still lost their lives. But the decisive battle that ended the war was D-Day. Uh, but the, the enemy still continued to fight back. And that's the exact same picture we have in Revelation 12, where it tells us that Satan, when he was cast out of heaven, and, and uh, tells us that he was filled with wrath, wrath because he knows his time is short, that he's already defeated. So the crucial engagements have been fought. And it doesn't mean that he quits. It means rather that until V-Day, victory in Europe, the, the opponent might, in fact, be so filled with rage that some of the worst struggle happens in that interval of time. And that's the sense that we have in the New Testament when we speak of our enemy. So that, so that we, the Bible talks in, in conclusive terms in that his head is crushed. But it also says that it's, 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 he still continues to act. But he does it without any authority, but only as being sovereignly controlled. Um, let's see. Well, let's quickly look at some other verses I think you need to see. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And I'm sorry, Laurie and John, that I, I didn't have these printed out for you. <coughs> it's okay. Okay, John, John chapter 12, verse 31. Oops. Oh, yeah. John chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus is talking about his, uh, about his death coming. And he says, now is the judgment of this world. See? This is a present indicative act. He says, now I am bringing my judgment against this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. That's the image of, of Revelation 12. The ruler of this world is cast out now, talking about at his, at his death and his resurrection. Then flip over to chapter 14, verse 30. Chapter 14, verse 30, he's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit coming. And he says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. So talking about the, the again, the devil coming, going to come against him and battle him at the cross. But he has no claim on him. And then flip over to 16, verse 11. 16, verse 11. Again, talking about the work of the Holy Spirit concerning sin, concerning righteousness. Verse 11, concerning judgment. Because the root of this world is already judged. Is already judged. <clears throat> the devil was judged, dethroned, cast out, totally defeated the day that Jesus died and rose from the grave. He's a defeated foe. Now he still roars, walks about like a roaring lion and all these different things. But here, here's what we need to realize. The enemy in chapter 6, verse 12 of Ephesians, it tells us that the spiritual forces of evil are in the heavenly realm. That is, that there is a spiritual realm that is hidden from you and me in this life. But rest assured that it is <coughs> is controlled by the sovereign King Jesus. Jesus bound Satan at the cross, crushing his head, crushing his rule, so that he could plunder the elect from sin's penalty, power, and, event, and eventual presence. The evil forces are in retreat. They cannot stop the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus even said to his disciples in Matthew 16, when, they asked, when he asked them, who do you say that I am? And they made the declaration, you are the the, um, uh, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said to them, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. It's a picture of the church militant advancing against the enemy to save the souls of men and women, to snatch lost people from the realm of the devil so that they would be saved and brought into the kingdom of heaven. And that's how Peter describes it. That they are, or Paul does in Colossians, that they are transferred from the kingdom of darkness 
into the kingdom of light. And in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus describes Satan as being bound. He says, in order for me to do this, you know that the kingdom is here because I go in and I bind the strong man and I have bound him so that he cannot stop me from plundering his, his domain. And he's talking again about going into the kingdom of darkness and saving people. And he does it because Satan and his demons and his angels are bound. They are spiritually bound. They are controlled by the, um, by the, uh, the sovereign God. <clears throat> and when we come to 2 Thessalonians, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, when we looked at the man of lawlessness, we saw that the man of lawlessness it has not come, but he's going to be revealed in the future. And the reason why we can't see him now is because he is hidden, because there is something that is restraining him, holding him back from being able to show himself. And that's why we cannot see him. Paul says in Ephesians that it's in the heavenly realm, this hidden spiritual realm that we can't see that Satan lives. And, the, and that's why I strongly believe that the, the, um, the man of lawlessness is in fact Satan himself. That one day at the end of the age, Satan will be revealed and the whole world will see him. And he will do his best to raise an army in battle against God. And that's described for us in Revelation 16 and also Revelation 19. Where he gathers the world together and Christ comes. Revelation 19, it comes riding on the horse with the banner, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he destroys Satan, casts him into the lake of fire. And even Revelation chapter 20, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether you believe that it's a literal thousand year millennial period or whether it's, it's a metaphoric picture of the, the church age, it's telling us the same thing about Satan, that he is bound that he is in chains right now, that he is limited and controlled in his power. Whether it is now or the millennium, it carries all the way through. He can do nothing unless God allows him to do it. Well, let me end with this because, because I, I think the life of Job really brings it all together. Um, when we come to Job, and as Tim had read for us from Job chapter 1, well, what we see here is the behind-the-scenes uh, conversation between God and the devil. And the first thing that we need to realize here is that it is God and not Satan who initiates the, the conversation about Job. Okay? So again, if you're thinking that, that the whole cause and reason of Job's suffering was Satan, it wasn't. God was putting him to the test. And God was going to use Satan as the means of doing that. And so God initiates the conversation. And the conversation demonstrates that Satan is not the initiator in Job's suffering. But God is. The second thing that we notice is that God limits what Satan can do to Job. He says, you can do everything you want, but this is the limit. This is as far as you can go. Can't touch his life, etc., etc. Satan is under divine permission. And then goes and tests Job. And, and understand that the affliction sent to Job had nothing whatsoever to do with punishment for sin. A lot of people try to think that. Okay, but Job was not being punished for sin. In fact, that was his dilemma. He says, I know I have not sinned in his conversations with his three men. He says, I know I have not sinned, so I can't understand it. God describes Job as being blameless and upright, a man who feared God and turned away from evil. The objective of the dialogue between God and Satan was to settle this question. Will Job continue to admit that everything that happens to him comes from the hand of God and at the same time still trust him and worship God? See, how does it describe Job as the wealthiest man in the whole region, right? He's never known problems. He's only known good. He's got great kids, great daughters, Lots of wealth. He put on these parties. He's well respected. He's a religious pillar in his community. He worships God. And everybody looks at Job and says, Man, Job, you've got it all in hand. Everything's going good. And then all of a sudden, one day. And we need to keep this in mind. Job had no idea of the conversation between Satan and God. 
So when it happened, all of his goods were taken away, when his kids were killed, when it was all gone, and when he was covered in boils, what did he say? In essence, he said, I don't understand, but I don't have to understand. Because if the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. See? He knew that God was sovereignly in control of his life. And he knew that everything that happened to him, whether good or bad, was in the plan of God that would ultimately be for his good and for the glory of God. And Job never did turn away from God. And his whole conversation with the other friends that he had kind of got messed up a little bit in his theology, but in the end he found that his theology didn't mean anything. All that he was left with is that God is trustworthy because God is the sovereign God. That he is the one who controls the good and the bad. Verse 10, shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? You ever say that in your own life? I mean, I've been sick for two weeks. And I can sit there and I can go, man, the devil is having a heyday with me. Oh, I sure wish God would come in there and intervene and make me all better and fight. See, that's not, that's wrong. God has allowed it. God has allowed this time of sickness. God has allowed it for no other reason than maybe for just so that I need to sit back and learn to trust in Him. When I was putting this message together, I, I tell you, my brain was in fogland. And I was still up late last night and I finally came to the end. And I, didn't even, I usually give Abby some notes. I didn't even print them off for her because they're such a mess. Do you know what I prayed this morning when I got up? I said, God, I can't do anything more now except trust you. See the difference? Faith in a sovereign God that is in control of everything, the good and the bad, is what makes us strong. It's not what the wealth and prosperity teachers talking. Don't listen to that crap. So I accept good and not the bad from the hand of God. I was going to show Paul's thorn in the flesh too, but I won't even go there. It's just getting late. So let me give you my conclusion. <clears throat> I'm going to read this. So I, I felt that this came from the Lord and hopefully it's... Dead. Friends, we are in a war of a most serious nature. And that war is not with flesh and blood, not against men and women alone, but against spiritual forces of evil who control and influence every government, every court, every education f facility, every institution of any kind, every religious organization in every nature, that is birthed in Adam in every heart that rebels against the sovereign rule of God. There are false teachers and false doctrine and false churches who claim to be on our side, but they are antichrists of the stealth kind who masquerade as sheep and angels of light. We are outnumbered, but not outmaneuvered. We are outvoiced, but not outpowered. We are an army with our shields linked together. We are a mighty army advancing in resurrected power. We are God's army and the gates of hell cannot withstand our advance. We are the formidable force boldly opening our mouths with the words of truth, of righteousness and salvation. We are the only army in the world who wins every battle and who is victorious in every defeat. We stand in the power of Christ. We stand firm in the victory of Christ. We overcome in the coming of Christ. Some of us advance slowly, others of us advance quickly. Some of us hold the banners high, while others of us wield the sword. Some of us pray, while others of us shout the battle cry. But all of us, 
Every last one of us shall rise when the mighty King comes. And all of us, every last one of us, will follow in His glorious train. And all of us, every last one of us, will enter into the eternal kingdom and behold the glory of the Lamb who sits on His throne in majesty and honor. And all of us, every last one of us, will lift our voices in praise and we will sing the new song for the Lord our God the Almighty reigns. God is in control of everything. Our birth, our parents, our nationality, our salvation, our church, who we marry, our children, every problem and struggle that comes our way, and even the time of our death. God determined the color of your hair. God determined whether you were a boy or a girl. God determined the color of your eyes, whether you are big boned or slim, short or tall, musical, artistic or logical. God is completely in control and I wouldn't have it any other way. And if we question those things, we question God's design and God's will and God's nature. I may not understand all things or see God's purpose in all things, but I will thank Him always and for everything. Like Job of old, biblical faith believes that God has sent every affliction, trial, and struggle, and God must have a good reason for doing so, even if we don't know the reason. Amen? Amen.